Hey, Sunshine. Hi, Ken. How are you? Doing good. Glad we put the record button on. Yeah, so this is our first meeting to discuss. Um, I want to say thank you for starting and mentoring me in this kind of journey that I'm getting ready to start, which is starting my first staking through Ethereum. And I think we're going to do Rocket Pool, right? Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. You know, this is interesting because I'm like, I would say I'm that non traditional staker validator because I, prior to three years ago, I knew nothing about cryptocurrency. And then I, I don't have a computer engineer software background. I wouldn't even say I'm very techie in general. So thank you for allowing me to be a mentee and you be my mentor. Happy to. You created this opportunity yourself. And so further context, you know, I myself um, have been leading the stake rocket pool handle and running some rocket pool nodes and partnered with the University of Cincinnati. And that's where I met you coming on campus mm -hmm. at the University of Cincinnati to tour the crypto lab, which is just so thick to see all this new hardware and to see the AI stuff, but, um, you know, still to see the gaps and, you know, the school can't run a node yet and people don't even understand why they should care about Ethereum staking, but, you know, you took the lead in being open. And so I'm really excited that we helped you create, you know, your own handle, your ENS, and to figure out how more individuals like you can, you know, win at crypto, because I've seen your passion. And for someone who, like me, I don't have a, you know, a software engineer background. Um, I am a, like an operations person, supply chain background, who worked in startups, and then just taught myself how to become an analyst and to find opportunities. And I think that's what you're doing. And I'm hoping we can create with, you know, a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program where more people can learn to stake Ethereum. Yeah. So the Ethereum network upgraded just last year from transition from proof of work to proof of stake. So could you just tell me when did you start staking and how did, how, what, how did that experience happen? Just curious. I, yeah, for sure. I mean, I started staking back in 2020 um, as soon as it was available. Uh, I mm -hmm. started off with more Ethereum than I had today. The funny thing is that Ethereum staking started off with the idea of 1500 Ethereum. That's what they thought was going to be required to run an individual validator. And that's a lot of money mm -hmm. today, considering Ethereum is around $1,900. But the idea was that they wanted to have, you know, a trade-off uh, between, you know, hardware costs and you know, token costs. I know we're going to get into this later. But um, I figured out I should put 32 Ethereum aside, which was the final number they decided on to stake. And so I started staking a node um, that was hosted. Um, I did a node myself on a uh, Raspberry Pi device, but because I moved okay. and I was in San Francisco, it went down and I was worried about you know staying online. So I did research and found somebody where I could, you know, service provider, all nodes, and I could use my own hardware wallet and I could run a node. And so I ran a full node starting in 2020 uh, and then realized that, you know, not everyone is going to be able to get 32 Ethereum and that, you know, just locking up all of your collateral and not having a liquid staking token, which is like an LSD, like a derivative available, was inefficient for finance. So the more I learned, the more I came of the belief that liquid staking was going to be the base framework of, you know, crypto in the future and DeFi. And so I wanted to figure out how to get more involved with Ethereum staking and how to support, mm -hmm. you know, people getting in who didn't have 32 Ethereum. And then that led me to Rocket Pool in 2022. So I started in 2020 and then got my way to Rocket Pool in 2022. Got it. So the way I, so I think it would be good to just really get a good understanding of what, what proof of stake mechanism is and what staking is. And I'll give you my understanding and maybe then you can kind of respond back and maybe go into more detail. So proof to just explain proof of work to proof of stake. So proof of work, and I did do a little bit in the, in the lab with proof of work mining, but basically it is that the proof of work is that the nodes or the computers are trying to solve a cryptographic puzzle or a mathematical problem. And really, when I look at it, it's like almost a race to get to the blocks. 
and you need a lot of hash power or computing power to get to those blocks. So the more hash power you have, faster node you have, the the more likely you're going to be able to create those blocks and create those transactions. Exactly. And then you're 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 given what it, whatever that token is for like a Bitcoin, for example. So that's proof of work for for me and when I look at Bitcoin. Is there anything else that you want to add to that as far as proof of work? No, it's just a I mean it's more complicated than mechanism. That, but... Yeah, it's more complicated, mm-hmm. but in essence it's like how do people agree to work together without having to talk to each other? And so they've agreed that you're going to use more electricity and more, you know, hardware devices, so GPUs. So the more of those you have as if you, you know, have more hydrogen power or you have more oil to produce electricity, then the more Bitcoin or, you know, proof of work tokens you could earn. Because those people believe that, you know, you can't invent money out of thin air and you have to expend some physical resource to then earn this new resource. And that's, you know, digital gold with Bitcoin for the mining. It's an analogy I don't think is that efficient or going to look well upon in the future, but it was the stepping stone for people to get started trusting each other on the internet without ever knowing each other or talking to each other. So like proof of work was the the starting point for blockchain consensus, but proof of stake is what I hope to hear your summary of next. And that's where I think most things will continue to thrive in the future. Yeah, so proof of stake is, Basically, I think of it as what it sounds like is someone that wants to to be able to be a part of the network. So they say, I want to I want to work. I want to run this network. I want to be a part of it. They're called now um, validators and you can and it gets a little bit more complex, but I'm sure we'll talk about it. There's the node validators and just the validators. So if you're a node validator, it means that you have a, an actual computer node and you need a little bit more computing power for that. But basically, you're carrying the whole Ethereum blockchain. You're keeping that data. So you need a little bit more memory and power for that because you're keeping track of that along with other nodes uh, across the world. A validator or a proof of stake validator is someone that stakes their Ethereum. And typically, a regular validator will be 32 Ethereum, um, although it can be smaller if you're in a mining pool. But they say, this is my collateral. This is kind of my fee that I'm putting in, which is my 32 staked Ethereum. And I'm going to run, help run the Ethereum network by creating block transactions and then also doing, doing other fees and also participating in um, the DAO or organizations and voting rights and that kind of thing. And then so they stake that in order to say, I'm going to be honest to the network. And then if they're honest, they get rewarded or they get compensated for their work. And if they're not honest or if they try to hack the network, then then they're they're punished or penalized with that 32 Ethereum. And from when I looked, it it seems like it can be something from offline, being offline for, you know, 24 hours. It's like really nothing. You just, you know, you're not going to get paid for your work versus when you're actually like trying to run. Um, multiple validators on the same key. what is it called key yes so so there's different like hashing things or whatever but basically you stake your ethereum to be an honest validator worker where you actually do work if you do work well done and good then you're going to get rewards and then you'll you'll continue to have compounding interest if you if you plan to get on there and actually do something that can compromise the network, then you're going to get penalized for that. And that's what actually the consensus mechanism, that's how it works because it keeps all of the validators honest. So that's how it makes it kind of like a trustless system. Yeah, that's exactly right. So proof of stake just relies on the amount of tokens you have instead of electricity and hardware devices. You still need a small hardware device, but now it's based on the amount of tokens that you lock up. So it's considered like moving it from your checking to your savings account. You know, there's a chance that the bank could go under, but those risks that you mentioned are often not seen for the average user. Uh, There's larger staking providers who will take on those risks and charge you a small fee for that. And that's where, you know, liquid staking comes around. 
Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's a trade off to lock up your tokens. And the good news is this is a more fair and equitable way of participating in a blockchain. And so that validator, like you described, um, can be someone who has 32 Ethereum and then runs a solo node. So it's called like solo uh, node operation. You can run it from home from a $2,000 device. I have one of those devices uh, at my home and uh, you can also run it remotely. But for those who don't have 32 Ethereum, you could do liquid staking, which is pooled staking. And you mentioned that, that was like the mining pooled staking. Similar concepts, mm -hmm. just like where people used to, you know, buy into a Bitcoin mining rig, you can like, quote unquote, buy into an Ethereum mining rig by simply just holding, you know, staked Ethereum tokens, because there's an operator on the back end, like Rocket Pool and like myself, who's keeping the network up, paying for the hardware costs, and you're, you know, paying those node operators for that service, but for you, less risk. Uh, just a way to set and forget and get passive yield. So I talked about a lot beyond just proof of stake, but yeah, it's locking up your tokens to get a reward. So just curious about 32. Eve. Yeah. What, where did that 32 magic number come from? The magic number came from like the price of Ethereum at the time. This research was done back in, you know, 2015, 2016. Originally, mm -hmm. they were thinking it should be 1500 Ethereum because there are trade offs and how you can secure a network. And so, you know, today, America is run by like four or five networks like Google, Meta, you know, uh, Amazon. They have massive data centers. The average person mm -hmm. can't invest that much in a data center, but the average person could go buy, you know, a $200 Raspberry Pi. So the goal for Ethereum was that anybody with low hardware costs and even low internet access, you know, far off in uh, remote parts of the world could still be a validator because Ethereum, you know, wants to prioritize decentralization. And so they wanted to have a lower bar on the hardware costs, but then a higher bar on the token costs. So they thought 1500 mm -hmm. was the right number, but then that turned out that like very few participants could invest. And so based on mm -hmm. like, the amount in individuals' wallets, everything in blockchain is public. They did more analysis and they determined, hey, if we take it down to 32, we think we can get more validators. And so it started off with, you know, 50,000 validators. Um, we're now at over 500,000 validators. Um, so that's people who have locked up 32 Ethereum around the world to run the network. And then there's even more validators mm -hmm. who are doing the pooled staking. Um, so it really has nothing to do with the block space or the, the publishing transactions or the block space. They just did basically a market analysis and said this would be the perfect amount of number for enough people to get in um, to make it, you know, financially appealing, but then also not let everybody in. Yeah, the block space debate was with Bitcoin and it was just related to, you know, uh, like you get it. The larger the block space, the harder it would be for a small person to run the network. Ethereum, mm -hmm. you know, is choosing different ways to scale, working with different providers. So like, okay. it's complicated, but in essence, the goal for Ethereum is that anybody can run, you know, the base layer, you know, layer mm -hmm. zero, it's called like a layer one blockchain Ethereum, but then the stuff mm -hmm. on top is consumer apps that needs high speed processing so that you can like refresh your page and play a game on the go. And so that will use, you know, high powered, you know, data centers to do some off chain computing um, and do some different trade-offs. But Ethereum chose 32 ETH because it's a little bit higher of a financial entry point. But on the other side, it's a lower cost of hardware or internet technology versus some of the other large blockchains like Polygon, you know, or Solana that it's like you know, thousands of dollars a month to run hardware like that in a data center. The goal of Ethereum is you can stake from home. And that's really mm -hmm. important that I want to help you learn, you know, when we all participate, we can own this layer of the internet together. But uh, without people learning, they don't understand why they'd want to own, you know, part of the future of Google. In essence, of the layer of the internet. You know, search is the layer of the internet we mainly use today. And so, the context that for Ethereum, Ethereum is you know the value transfer layer of the internet. And the chance now is to own some of that. So yeah, that was kind of my next question, which you've kind of answered. I've kind of looked up, but I also wanted to hear from you. And you know, the question is, you know, why stake Ethereum? I mean, I think the obvious is it's the second largest <laughs> cryptocurrency by market cap, and 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 the 
the growth in comparison would, would be number one. And then with the transition of proof of stake for me, that kind of gives more of an opportunity, like you were saying to someone that, you know, previously before didn't know how to use the mining hardware with proof of work. So now you have a, an opportunity for someone to get in entry level for, for proof of stake. And then the entry level is significantly went down. So it seems like it's a lower risk kind of high reward as far as proof of stake. And then obviously the rewards and the interest rate, but could you tell, say like a little bit more on why you think staking Ethereum in, is something that is beneficial um, as far as the future growth of Ethereum? Yeah, here's a blog post uh, that I'll share as a reference, but staking Ethereum it will be the default for Ethereum in the future. If you're holding on to it, you're not planning to like sell it that day. The average person is looking to set and forget. And so mm -hmm. it makes more sense to hold staked Ethereum because it pays you passive income. And so like why Ethereum of all the thousands of crypto projects, it's like, show me the money, you know, like, Currently, we're in a recessionary environment. There's lots of fear on what's going to happen ahead. And when there's fear, you know, people mm -hmm. only pay for what they really need, or what they think they need. And so this is a report from actually earlier this year, you know, showing you know, how much money uh, Ethereum made. Um, this is just revenue from individuals around the world who wanted to use the blockchain. And so by paying for a transaction on Ethereum, you know, Ethereum is making money. And Ethereum's revenue just far exceeds any competitor. So the tokenomics and economics around Ethereum as like a tech company um, and as a business is coming together quickly now so that we'll be able to have, you know, a connection between traditional finance investing terms, um, like you do with stocks to price to earnings or, you know, price to sales that is now available with, you know, blockchains and specifically token terminal uh, provides this really good dashboard. It is paid now, but when this was previously available, it was free. And, um, most people want to invest in companies that make money and they make money because they have high demand from customers. And so Ethereum has a lot of high demand and the demand, you know, that's clear thus far is this decentralized finance stack. Are you able to see my screen with this? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, cool. Um, so like, you know, decentralized finance is how we do banking without middlemen. It makes so much sense right. with Venmo or like PayPal, mm -hmm. but we still like can't do some basic settlement stuff. So Ethereum sits yeah. at the base of all of this. And, um, you know, it, currently we don't have regulation in the United States, which makes it unclear and maybe scary for some people to understand. But uh, mm -hmm. the more you learn, you realize that Ethereum truly is, you know, at the, the floor of the future of decentralized finance or even decentralized gaming or even decentralized social because individuals want to hold their own data. They don't want to give away their most valuable resource. You know, data is the oil. And if data is the oil, you know, Ethereum is the internet money that makes the data oil machine work. And as privacy becomes more important and more individuals realize they want to, you know, have transparency in their finances, it makes sense to bring every, your finances on chain, just like we have brought, you know, our lives on the internet over the last 20 years. Internet has only been around about 30 years. You know, it's going to look back that like our lives and finance will be online. Why would you ever trust a bank that doesn't, you know, report how much money they have in the bank? You know, that's going to be the default ahead and Ethereum will, you know, power that world that we see. So I went on a bit of a long way of saying why staked Ethereum is the answer. But, you know, for 95% mm -hmm. of people out there, I think it's just a great opportunity to participate in this next evolution of the Internet. You know, it's like a set and forget thing. And, you know, I personally am you know, heavily into the community and it's there's extremes that you see there's certain people who you know have all the retirement accounts in this and there's certain people who still think it's a scam so it's up to each person to do their own research and i mm -hmm. hope that uh you can ask me all of your uh tough questions so we can yeah i do have a question now. for you yeah please so when you you know obviously there is definitely sustained growth in ethereum and as <clears throat> what you just showed um, on those charts but in comparison to those who are, say, investing in Ethereum um, on an exchange and then can cash out when the price goes goes up, what would that difference be? And what does the staking look like as far as risk? Is there still, um, I, I know that the Shanghai upgrade allowed a lot of validators to unlock. So what is the, the um, lockup phase now? Um, and what, is that, what does that look like? Yeah, great question. The lockup time period is about 27 days for full validators. So that means that a validator determines that they would like to unstake, they leave, they enter a queue, that queue will process other validators and then, you know, dump it into users' wallets. Uh, there was a lot of fear that there was going to be more unstaking than staking. 
but the truth is and that didn't so, happen exactly so you know ethereum less than 10 yeah. percent of ethereum was staked at the start of this year when most other blockchains are around you know 50 to 80 percent staked meaning most investors just lock it up and earn passive income already but since ethereum you know mm -hmm. didn't have that yet and was used in all these different applications people didn't trust and they couldn't get it out yet so early participants who staked like me earned a higher ethereum rate of return you know but you know, for most people, they didn't even want that because they didn't trust they could get it back. So for full nodes, you know, it's about a month. So it's technically about 27 days. It could be less. For anybody who's doing liquid staking, you know, it's 24/7, 365, meaning that you know you okay. buy your stake ETH, you know, and then something bad happens and you need to get it back. You can exchange mm -hmm. it for dollars, you know, real time anywhere on Uniswap or on. Is, a, yeah. is that the node operator that runs the mining pool as well? Or the pool uh, node well. operators have longer lockup periods. Okay, that's what so I figured. Like that the, makes yeah, sense. It's okay. about like a month and a half, actually. So with Rocket Pool, okay. it's longer than it is mm -hmm. with a full node. So your Rocket okay. Pool is pooled staking, hence the mm -hmm. pool, meaning that like you take your 16 or 8 ETH and match up with somebody else and it's put in a smart contract. But then once there's enough, it's locked up and then, you know, it's unlocked and you have to wait for that additional step than doing it yourself. You know, the good news is okay. it's permissionless, means anyone can join, anyone can exit. It's not like there's one central group that would stop it with Rocket Pool. And that's why we're starting there. You know, decentralization mm -hmm. really matters. And your question of like, hey, I could do this on an exchange. Why would I do it on an exchange? Well, you would do it on an exchange because you don't realize that you really don't own anything on an exchange. It's just right, a certificate. Yeah. It's a piece of paper that could, you know, go up in flames like FTX. But when you have your private right. key and you hold it yourself in your own wallet, you know, that's what crypto is invented for peer to peer and the meme of not your keys, not your crypto, you know, is where I'm trying to guide you on self custody. So that was the piece of, you know, it's a little bit harder to start to do self custody staking. But once you get a process of it, it's truly, you know, limitless. Like I've been able to mm -hmm. send large transactions on a Sunday night for, you know, less than a dollar. And that was just so awesome. Like I lost a job and I took a loan out in DeFi on some of my Ethereum. And then I paid back my loan, you know, got my Ethereum back and it all worked out for me a bank would not have given me a loan because they would say too much risk. You know, and even though what I look like and where I'm from and having worked in Silicon Valley, you know, there's still some risk they don't want to take, but you know, the internet and technology is unbiased. It's just code. And so the code doesn't. That's a great example. That's a great example. Um, okay. So do you want to move into like the types of staking? Sure. I can go over them really quick and then anything that you can add. So I, I think I have like the types of staking down. We talked about the, the solo staking, which is you're running your own validator node and that's like straight on the beacon chain there. So it's just you and yourself, you're in charge of um, your, your node. So you're in charge of all the hardware, securing it and everything else. And you have to stake your 32 week. So that's a solo staking operator. And there's um, two ways you can do that. We'll create a guide for this as a follow-up but you okay. can be a solo staker by doing everything at home, or you could also pay somebody else to do it. So it's so staking the as a service. Staff. Yeah. So the staking as a service is you would, you have 32 weeks. You just don't want to deal with the hardware and the management of the software. So you're paying somebody else to do that basically. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the last part is the staking pools, which my understanding is well before, before we do the staking pools, I did have a question. So there is this that I read about in the future that there is going to be staking by sharding. Do you, can you talk about that at all? Just very briefly, because I was, I was kind of intrigued by it and I know we're not in quite the sharding phase yet, but I, I was just wondering how this concept will go down. So I believe they're just talking about optimized staking. So mm -hmm. how can you optimize your capital so that it's always working for you and there's nothing that's just mm -hmm. sitting on the sideline. So sharding is a way that they plan on scaling, meaning you just don't have one path. You've got lots of different little shards that will connect back. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about ways that you can, you know, stake more efficiently um, with sharding, or you can restake. That's a current narrative going around with eigenlayer. So restaking. So it's after you've already staked, you also decide to support this next blockchain and you will get their tokens, but you could lose some of your staking yeah. rewards for supporting, you know, eigenlayer. So the idea is that mm -hmm. there's going to be just that view of the whole stack. So it's going to keep optimizing the stack mm -hmm. and then you want to own the bottom of the stack. Because when you're on the bottom yeah, so of the stack, everybody wants your help. Right. So then they'll just kind of deal these shards and then so they'll build atop the beacon chain and then just do other chains that you can actually stake them there. Right? Is that yeah, exactly. And there's okay. different risks okay. associated with all the you know additional chains mm -hmm. or the shards. And so mm -hmm. you know, we're focused on the proven projects that have been around for a long time. 
We're not trying out, you know, brand new startups. We're doing right, battle tested right. projects that others can trust, you know, and it can't okay. be shut down by a centralized entity. Yeah. Okay. So the, um, the actual, um, pools, um, you can have, basically I broke them down into either decentralized or centralized. So your centralized pool, I just was thinking of the top five, which would be like Coinbase, Binance, Kraken. Those are exchanges, but they're centralized to their own. Um, so technically you don't really own, like you were saying, you don't really own the, the staking. You just get a yield back. It seems like it could be a risk based on if the exchange goes down. Coinbase files for um, bankruptcy, then um, you know you could actually lose all of your staking Ethereum. Or if the, the validators get tacked, you could lose your, your Ethereum. Up. So you don't really have control over it with these centralized um, pools. And it's then the counterparty risk. Exactly. You're discussing mm -hmm. the counterparty risk. So it's centralization creates risk. And that mm -hmm. is what you were highlighting, that savvy investors and people, this is not financial advice, this is just education, but we found that diversification has won a Nobel Peace Prize before um, in finance, and it also relates just in, you know, life. And so keeping as little as you can on a centralized exchange and trusting, you know, a business seems to be kind of great wisdom, but these businesses provide great services, and sometimes they provide services you can't get otherwise. So using them at the right time, but then, you know, ensuring that you do the work to hold your own assets is the major unlock yeah. that we're trying to help create. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think with decentralized as well, it poses a risk for yourself. So as long as you are putting in the the work to do decrease your risk, um, hopefully it's decreased, but there's still that risk there that, you know, there could be something that happens from a security perspective, or if you get slashed for some reason, or if your internet goes out, I mean, there's still a lot of risk that's involved in a decentralized scenario. Yeah, that's exactly right. So there's always risk and you just have to weigh them. And so if you typically just do small tests, and that's my hope for you. As you know, we get some RE that's Rocket Pool's liquid staking token in your wallet and you can see what it's like and you can figure mm -hmm. out how you'd like to stake and become a node validator. Getting back to your question on pooled staking, you know, that's liquid staking or LSDs or LSTs, liquid staking tokens. And that's really been mm -hmm. the major wave for Ethereum infrastructure. And like you said, there is the centralized and Coinbase also offers their own version of a decentralized token that's you know traded on open markets but they're the only counterparty that can you know do the unstaking so there's different degrees of decentralization options um, and there are also mm -hmm. different degrees on the decentralization but we're leaning towards starting with yeah. you know uh rocket pool instead of lido um, mm -hmm. because lido is centralized and rocket pool is not so let's kind of look at the the lsd or the liquid staking derivatives uh, and in particular uh, rocket pool can you talk about the types of validators how that works node operators validators pool mini pool and rocket pool yeah, Rocket Pool, you know, was created in 2016 to make staking more uh, accessible. And so there's one side where there's a node operator, a validator, and then there's the other side, which is the liquid staking token. So let's talk about the validator. Instead of putting up 32 Ethereum, you're only putting up eight Ethereum or 16 Ethereum. And so you're pooling your Ethereum in a smart contract with someone else on the internet. And then you're locking up your Ethereum along with some RPL tokens. That is the Rocket Pool token. And you add that into your validator to provide collateral for the liquid staking token. And so the idea is that your Ethereum is staked. And if there was a slashing event, you know, uh, that Ethereum would still be good. They would go after your RPL tokens. Um, and RPL collateralizes the liquid staking RETH tokens that are created by every new node validator. So it's a when a node validator decides to lock up Ethereum, then more RETH is created onto the open market. And so this two-pronged approach enables larger investors who have, you know, eight, 16, or 32 Ethereum, and they want to earn more rewards, and they earn more rewards by earning RPL rewards and a percentage of the rewards from these small investors who don't have enough, you know, to invest the full amount, but they still want to stake. And so um, there's two products that Rocket Pool offers for the average person. It's going to be, you know, their staked ETH token, which is a little R and a capital ETH. And that's what I want to help yeah. get you into your wallet. And so, you know, it's really not that complicated. You just have to get that token into your wallet mm -hmm. and then it pays a dividend. So that passive income, the staked ETH return will just accrue to that asset as it sits in your wallet. That's like an innovation okay. of crypto. And you just expect things, you know, we're in the day, everything's digital. Like this is how it should mm -hmm. work. If you have an asset and it earns interest, you just sit and you hold it. You don't do anything. When you're in the future, you're ready to liquidate it. You're going to accrue all of those staking rewards um, and that passive income that could be tax optimized depending on where you live. Okay, great. So let's say I have three separate accounts. The yep. first account is my ETH account, okay? And that is put in an account for slashing or anything if I do harm to the network, and that's where my ETH will get slashed. The other account is the RPL account, and that is where I'm actually going to accrue interest, correct? You accrue interest on both of them? The RPL? Including the RETH. 
the the RPL. ETH is, is outside. So node operators, okay. it's just RPL and ETH. Mm -hmm. um, liquid staking individuals, it's just the RETH token. Liquid staking people uh, do not need the RPL token. They just want staked okay. Ethereum. Okay, so then if you're a um, node validator, that's when you get the actual RPL. Exactly right. And you get that because okay. that's a requirement of their system. And, the and system... that is just so you're a validator and you're honest and then that RPL will get slashed if you did something to your node people or your um, stakers. Exactly right. You have to be over collateralized. So the idea is that under collateralization okay. is never going to work. You have to put up more money than you're ever trying to borrow or, you know, create leverage with. And so okay. the RPL is what is the collateral for the liquid staking tokens on the market. Mm -hmm. The dynamics and tokenomics get quite, you know, complicated. And if there's some turmoil in the markets, you know, there's a chance that things wouldn't operate as the team had planned. But, you know, it is working well right now. And small mm -hmm. investors, individuals just need to get staked ETH. It's the node operators who need the rocket pool token because that's the collateral for the small investors. Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So if you're, cool. so it's, let's say you're my node operator on the staker, you're going to have the RPL and you're going to have the ETH. Will you also have the RETH as well? You'll have all three? No, we, the RETH no. is given out to the market. Um, Got it. So every okay. time you unstake a rocket pool validator, which is a mini pool, some mm -hmm. RETH is taken off of the market. So you uh, need to have okay. more validators to then create mm -hmm. more liquid staking tokens. There's market dynamics that you can't just have too much of one and the other. So Lido, Got the it. main competitor to Rocket Pool, decided not to be centralized. They decided to trust on like five to 10 large venture capital firms and businesses to validate the network. Mm -hmm. And they just took in as mm -hmm. much Ethereum as anybody wanted to send in. They charged a little bit lower fee, um, you know, 10% for liquid staking. But it turned out mm -hmm. in today's market that, you know, there's so much risk with centralization of Lido that their mm -hmm. liquid staking token doesn't trade at the market price. So personally, I lost money staking with Lido because I thought I was going to get more Ethereum back than I did because of the mm -hmm. market pricing. So most people think like, oh, I'm going to earn this rate of return, but that's not how things work. Sorry, please ask. So is this a token burn then when a validator leaves? A node validator Correct. leaves? Correct. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. If, if, a, if a validator goes down, then you, they need to decrease the supply in order to keep it still demanding. That's exactly right. You can't just okay. have an unlimited thing of one and mm -hmm. assume it came from nowhere. It's like, you know, there's no free lunch is a okay. old analogy. And that's where the Bitcoin mm -hmm. people get around their idea of, hey, you have, have to have electricity to create this thing. And so, you know, Rocket Pool community is like, hey, you have to have RPL tokens to collateralize your node um, so we can create more liquid staking tokens for the public. And we're going to protect mm -hmm. the public because you put up not only Ethereum, but RPL. And so we're going to you know, slash your RPL if anything happens to the public's, you know, the small investors, but you're earning, you know, on both of those, so you're earning a higher rate of return on your Ethereum than you could otherwise. And you're also right. earning, you know, staking your RPL. Um, so the trade-off you know, is great for those who do their research or at least are open to that, you know, risk return. Okay. So I understand, I understand that then. So the, the node validator which is kind of that supervisor of all the stakers and is managing everything and collateralizes the their node with the rpl token basically saying that if it goes down for any reason then basically it's just going to disintegrate or burn um that makes well, sense it's disintegrate or burn but yeah it'll you know and then would the other um the other stakers have to go to another node validator or leave they could decide what to do it'll be taken care of for them um, oh Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's dynamics in the background. When you have the token in your wallet, um, mm -hmm. you know, you can feel rest assured that you have the staked Ethereum um, and you can then go on the open market and, you know, trade back for another asset that you want. You know, liquidity is quite low in the markets today and the average person doesn't understand inflation or you know, market liquidity. But um, in, in short, you know, the answer is yes. When node operators okay. get out, the RETH is removed from the market small investors don't need to do anything. Okay. And so going back to um, the RE, yeah. that's what earns the APY, correct? So RE is the liquid staking token, correct, that earns Ethereum staking rewards for Can you explain you know, that small a little bit investors. More? Yeah. You take your Ethereum, you exchange it for staked Ethereum. And in the mm -hmm. background, 
um, your Ethereum is being sent to a smart contract and it's being locked up with these other node validators Ethereum because they put up mm -hmm. way more than all these other small fish, but together they create 32 and it goes and gets locked on the execution chain. And after a couple of days, it's, you know, more liquid staking tokens are created on the open market. Um, but small investor, it's a simple process. You, you buy the liquid staking token and there's work going on in the background that is earning you Ethereum by validating the network. So you're actually kind of putting into that RE every time a validator um, is becoming online, right? Because you're... Yeah, so once again, this is not financial advice. You know, um, this is just education. And the education here is how does Rocket Pool work? How does Ethereum work? And it works in that early participants are rewarded more than late participants because early participants take more risk. And so you can see that the current rate of return right now is, you know, 3.22% in Ethereum for the liquid staking RE token holders. Um, and then the rate of return for the node operators is around 8.4% in Ethereum. Um, in addition to Rocket Pool rewards, which is around 7%. Um, and the dynamics for those rate of return depends on a variety of different things, but it can be simplified. Like I said, the sooner you get in, um, when there's less participants, the higher rewards, the more participants, the less the rewards will be. And um, so that's why the rewards are higher than what they're projected to be, you know, five to 10 years out when more individuals uh, come to understand that staking Ethereum is what they want to do. And, you know, they'll take whatever that risk-free rate of return is. So this rate of return right here, 3.22% is like the risk-free rate of return um, that most people count on today from bonds. So a bond, you know, like a U.S. Treasury bond may pay, you know, 3% over 10 years. The way I think about it is, you know, liquid staking tokens have a bond of around 3% in Ethereum right now. That could probably go down to 1%, but assuming, you know, a 1% to like 5% rate of return in Ethereum is what I would expect for liquid staking token holders. You know, that's very little when you think about investing and when you do the math. I know you and I have had private combos like, hey, this is like, this doesn't make sense right now. And it doesn't make sense when you look at it on a short time period. But if you look at this in a five or 10 year timeline, maybe you just start with 36 months, which is three years then you can figure out, you know, maybe a better, you know, business case for how you can win at staking your Ethereum. But, you know, there's no shortcuts to the trade-offs to earn passive income. You know, it's just learning and then getting it set up and you know, letting the rest take care of itself once you have, you know, stake deep. But that's where we're trying to get you on board to get your stake deep. And I think I ranted. So tell me. Uh, oh, <laughs> no, um, I think here. this is, you know, this is kind of like the, the complex part, I think for me is, is, is understanding kind of the operations under the hood, how this works as far as what happens when you, stake your ETH and, and what kind of rewards um, are you looking at? Because what I looked at is there's there's five ways that you can earn rewards. So the APY is not just the, the five ways that you can earn rewards. And it looks like, you know, some rewards may be more and it, it may only occur um, on certain times, maybe once a year. And it may occur on occasions where you're that it's it's overcoming, disputing a block together, or it can occur more if you're more involved in the network. So I did see that you could earn more as far as rewards. And, and then I was looking at kind of the slashing. It would be nice maybe next time to maybe condense that and go over in detail what that means and get a good under, understanding of what what you're trying to avoid with your, your slashing and then also the uh, the rewards of how you can participate in the network. You got it. We can dive deeper into those rewards in part two and the slashing. You know, you already understand the slashing quite well, which is you're penalized when you don't follow the rules. The rules are transparent. The rules are code that anyone can find anytime. Now, hey, everybody breaks the rules. Oftentimes it's by accident um, or there's malicious actors out there. And so for the average person, 98% you know, of us are just going to, you know, uh, not be malicious. And so, you know, you don't have to worry about those, those risks, but to know what they are, I think is really important for you who wants to be a node mm -hmm. operator and to figure out the backup plan. It's not like if your internet goes out, you're going to lose your eight ETH or your 16 ETH and your rocket pool validator. It's more so that you're just right. not going to earn staking rewards until you're back online. So happy to make our next session on slashing and rewards. And I'd like to actually okay. cover, you know, the different ways that you could be, you know, a node operator or, you know, easy ways to just get started with, you know, getting some RETH. So I'm excited okay. for part That'll two. Work. Yeah. Do you think there's anything that we didn't discuss that you think it would be important for me to know kind of a, a getting started? Uh, just self-custody. You did the hard work and, you know, you got the rainbow wallet um, and to try and just to ask any question. There's no dumb questions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we plan on, I plan on sharing this video with the world and hopefully others can ask us questions and we can figure out, you know, each person is different in the way they learn. And, you know, I definitely struggled in school and, and learning and realized like everyone has their own way. Just let me know how I can help you keep asking for help because there are a lot of magical, helpful people on the internet, but you know, there's also, you can get lost in the sauce of the negative stuff yeah. for people following the trend. And we're trying to change that up here. I'm really grateful that you as sunshine staking.eth 
you know, asked me to do this AMA and I'm just excited to take it wherever you want to go. Awesome. I am too. And I appreciate all your knowledge and, and time and I, I'm excited to get started. Love it. So that's all for today. Thanks. All right. Thank you.